And so I think uh, I think this is just symptomatic of a, of a of an inability to let, let yourself be wrong um, and, and to emote. I think related. I think we're confused at times between ideas and people. And so if you are staking out a strong claim, you must hate the people who claim the opposite. That's, that's a generalization, but I think that's a good deal of confusion that I find among my peers. You, you must be a hater, or you must be, I don't know. We just get confused between the people that we're opposing and the actual ideas. And I think we can more easily conflate those. I can't tell you exactly why, but that's one thing that I noticed. Yeah, um, to be a little more meta, I, I tried to, to ground my explanation in, um, in this like media ecology thing. So I was a communications guy in, in school, and, and um, I love Neil Postman. And, and back in like 81 or 82, you're we amusing ourselves to death, where he looks at um, media, religion, politics, and education, and says, um, we have adopted Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Um, where everything is about amusement and not about um, I, not about substance. Um, that, that's art. Art. That's 1982, right? And and I was born in '84, so I, I literally I think have have grown up swimming in that <coughs> world. Um, Postman's writing pre Apple, right? Pre MTV, all these things, and and look where we've gone. He was prof he was prof he was prophetic. I, I tried to who he was, and so my generation is just. The embodiment of this culture that says it's all about consumption, it's all about you, it's all about um, the material, it's all about emotional um, uh, uh, experiences and gratification, exactly. And and so what Andrew said and, and what um, what Jessica said is exactly right. It's just light. It's just light fair. It's just emotion um, because of everything that we're, we're swimming in and. and if we don't, and we can talk about Mark Knoll, we can talk about you know evangelical edu intellectual history and everything that has gone wrong in that realm. I think we're recapturing some of those things, but um, we've got to build back up a lot of the framework that includes the hard work of ideas and, and an intellectual life. If we're ever going to get to a place where people can have a, a, an Augustinian Christian ethic, I mean, how many people our age know Augustine? Right? It's just silly to even expect that. Uh, I'd encourage you to go check out um, Ryan Anderson of the Heritage Foundation was on Pierce Morgan last Tuesday night uh, with Susie Orman, who's a lesbian, and, and Pierce, and it was a totally hostile environment. And at one point, Susie Orman says, well, you, have your, you know your facts. <laughs> and the argument stopped at that point because she was basing all of her principles upon emotion. And when you go back to the tape and review Ryan's comments, he weaves together a very airtight, sound, logical argument that is <clears throat> utterly meaningless when you have, uh, you know, a, a sitcom based on sound bites and emotivism. Um, yeah, I would also point out uh, that we, in this room, in the city, we're dealing with a very exceptional group of people um, who do actually care about ideas and learning. Um, the broader population around the country. It's not that they don't necessarily care, but they're not spending their days thinking through these matters. Um, and so when it, when it comes up, you know, when last week you see, you, then you see 2.4 million people changing their Facebook profile pictures to an equal sign because, oh, well, I haven't thought about it that much, but yeah, everyone else is, um, and that sounds great. Who doesn't like equality? Um, so, I mean, that's just, that's just generally the the rest of the country, I think, um, doesn't isn't thinking through things as much as we are. Um, being not a panelist, but being the moderator, I'll, I'll speak to this as well. I, I think that, that, that a disconnect is really obvious in, in some of the discourse last week where you had a, uh, a, a one, one friend who, who's, who, who said, you can't your, impose your morality on me, but in the very next sentence said, we are all in. We are given the ability to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. So at one point they're denying there's any natural law at all. In the very next sentence, they're they're appealing to natural law as as a position of equality, which is I find absurd. Yeah. Um, I think that 
So that's my end. Another question. Yes. Uh, Nat Nasworth of the Christian Post. Uh, Eric, you, you mentioned Mark Knoll, um, and he, he talked about the scandal of the evangelical mind. Is that there is no evangelical mind? And so I wonder how that fits with the uh, orthodoxy versus or- orthodoxy, because it seems to me that evangelicals, at least in part, provided the foundation for the orthodoxy. You know, we, we, we influence culture in a bad way with our own anti intellectualism, and so how does that fit into your whole distinction between the two? Did you get that? Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, I I went to a church that will remain nameless here in D.C. for for three years, and um, and it was Oprahoxy. Um, one day, a pastor got up in front of everyone, and, and he said, um, I think this was during the benediction, I just want to say I think it's wonderful that here in this community of believers, we have people whose full-time job is to be pro-life activists and people whose full-time job is to be pro-choice activists. I thought, no, no, that's not <laughs> wonderful. That's not something to, it's not good that someone who does that full-time feels to completely welcome in this community, no holds barred. They should feel pressure. They should feel uncomfortable because this church should be teaching that what you're doing with your days is the antithesis of the God that you're worshiping right now. But we don't do that because we don't want to turn people away. We don't want, we don't want to take a stand. We don't want people to feel like their faith is going to be the starting point and it's going to actually change the way that, that they live, right? Instead, we have pastors who wear true religion brand genes. How ironic is that, right? <laughs> While talking about, like, you know, climbing Machu Picchu, it's just, it's just entertainment. It's, it's amusing ourselves to death. It's not teaching the word of God. It's not establishing a found ethic. And I think that we have to blame our seminaries for that, to the extent that our pastors have even gone to seminary, right? We have to, as, a, as, a, as evangelicals, as a, as a little subculture, we've got to hold ourselves accountable for these problems because it is, in large part, our fault. Yeah. yeah, to echo what Eric says, I mean, and, and what I was saying in my, my address is that we, we've got to make an inward turn towards the church and, and hold our, our clergy accountable for uh, offering hard, gut-wrenching sermons. Uh, I, I'm call myself a Southern Baptist, sojourning with the Anglicans right now. I attend Truro Anglican in Fairfax. And uh, three weeks ago was the first time in my entire Christian life I'd ever heard a pastor address same-sex marriage from the pulpit. And I come from a Southern Baptist background, which we all know where the Southern Baptists are on this. This is, you know, any spokesman for the SBC is, is very clear. But I attended very prominent, a very prominent evangelical seminary, that was solid on the issue, but even in the churches of the city where my seminary was, never heard sermons dedicated to confronting uh, difficult moral issues. And so we need to recover this idea that the church is a, is a moral community and our ministers need to recover their God-given authority to, to be agents of moral formation. Yeah. Uh, one more question. I, I perceive the problem as the migration of academics from a, hu- a human liberal arts foundation to a scientific foundation. And law is a very significant example of that. There's a scientific foundation now. Science doesn't countenance moral issues. And so if all of our academics in the universities and everywhere else in the seminaries are based on the scientific foundation of making proofs, I don't see how we can move beyond any of these problems. And I'm wondering whether any of the people have <coughs> comment on that. Let me uh, trans- summarize that. So you, what you're saying is that there's this, you recognize a difference between what perhaps was a uh, um, liberal arts way of looking at the world into a scientific way of looking at the world. And now most of our 
universities and perhaps even seminaries are, are looking at the world through the framework of scientism or, or scientific proofs, how does that impact then this, this issue of, of young evangelicals in communicating the poetry? Blackstone began his commentaries with a theological dissertation. Um, liberal positivism would have no interest in that. And, and they are the kinds of jurisprudence which dominate the legal system now, not the ones that are based in morality. Yeah, I, I wrote an article a while back called We're All Materialists Now. And um, I would actually bring the scientism argument back further to a, uh, a materialistic worldview. And I, I think the materialistic worldview is, is, is not commensurate with moral discussions of, of metaphysics and ethics. And uh, I was actually in a room with a prominent author, and he said off the record, he's like, you know, uh, I, I think America is fundamentally an unserious nation now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually kind of broke my heart when he said that, because uh, it was kind of like he thinks America is beyond the pale of, of recovery. And I don't hold that position. I, as I said, I'm the most optimistic person I know. Uh, but there is a sense in which uh, there is a we are lacking a moral vocabulary that allows us to have deeper discussions in this country, and it's plaguing us. Uh, the issues that that should be the forefront are the very issues that we're we're incapable. It's not that we just won't address them. I think that our climate, the, the moral ecology that we've we've created, actually makes it um, makes us incapable of having those conversations. Thank you. So this comes back to. Um, you know, in, in your typical evangelical conversation. Actually, our wives, we, we're very close friends, and our wives one Friday night were like, would you guys just stop talking about the stuff you talk about? <laughs> and, and we're not trying to talk bad about our wives, uh, but I think that's... I'm like, not. Yeah, he's not. <laughs> but that's somewhat, epi I mean, that's epidemic of, of evangelical social thought at large. Um, this kind of like, can we just stop asking the tough questions? And so, again, not to speak ill of either of our wives, we never do such a thing. But uh, this comes back to, again, and I keep saying it, we've got to understand the, the moral authority of the church and, and call Christians and call our, our clergy to reclaim that recovery. All right, I, I said that was the last one, so I, I need to keep it there. Um, Why? No? Okay. I, it looks like I'm a, I, 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 the uh, woman at the peach shirt. You, yes. I am. I am. I, I saw your hand. Sorry. Um, listening to this and, and, and having millennials is my very own that I own. Um, I just really would like to know behind all this stuff. I just feel like there's just this tremendous fear. And that's, I feel like there are people running around because they're afraid. <clears throat> what is it that this generation is so terrified of that's keeping them from um, grabbing this up and doing it? Let me, let me, let's, let's, we're having, we're being, you got it? All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of this um, as, Kind of, I think it goes back to the need for self for affirmation, and we've been we've grown up being told that um, we need to we can do anything we can we can do anything we want. We so our lives are about our self actualization, and they're all about ourselves. Um, and this is another way I think that even <laughs> marriage has been redefined as. Uh, self fulfillment. You do it for yourself. You wait till you're absolutely right. You know, you till you're completely sure. Um, and so, when somebody tells you that what they think you're doing is wrong, um, or they don't agree with your choices, then that is an assault on your very self, who you are. Because by making the choices you're making, you are fulfilling who you truly are. Um, and so, it's just. I, I see my generation as just on this, we just crave affirmation and um, and in all of our choices and everything. That's why we love tolerance so much because and, 
the end tolerance, you know, there's a short jump from tolerance to affirmation because we need everybody to affirm us and, <coughs> and what we're doing and what our choices are. And you know, we grew up in the generation where everybody gets a ribbon for participating and there's no there's no winner or loser. It's it's all about if you're um, if you make the effort and you participate. Um, so we're very fearful of judgment of, of all sorts, of moral judgments, um, of um, you know, theological judgments, what is the right thing to believe. Um, and so this, you know, ultimately there's a very real, um, we see a lot of these evangelical leaders even going into universalistic teachings um, where there is no ultimate truth. Um, and that is the ultimate affirmation, I think, um, that it doesn't matter what you believe, you're going to be fine in the end. Um, there is no right thing to believe. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. So. The, a uh, slight follow-up. I think, too, I see we don't always have a vision for the hope beyond our advocacy, the sort of the long-term vision. Um, and if we have our parents and grandparents kind of noticing the cultural differences, but we never knew what it was back then, we can sort of, we know that there's truth that is not being reflected in our culture, but we're not always confident about what we're pursuing, and we're not always confident in the Lord that even if we end up getting jailed for holding unpopular opinions, that in the long term, that may be a, a, a good, and, and God will provide for his people even during times of persecution. So I'm, I'm grateful that I'm hearing that message in my church, that my family believes that, but I think that's pretty rare. And that's beginning to encourage me even you know, in holding these sorts of positions. Yes. Uh, frankly, I, I blame our generation for the mess we're in. Uh, Southern Baptist Convention issued a major statement on the scandal of Southern Baptist divorce in 2009 uh, or 10 and, uh, and didn't propose anything to be done about it. They said, we have to face this issue, yes. But three years later, the, the words seem rather hollow. It's not... There's not a strategy by the Southern Baptists to do anything about it, either pastorally or legally. When no fault divorce came in 40 years ago, the Catholics were silent, the Baptists were silent, the Methodists were silent, they were all silent. And then we now see the horror of it. We've seen the divorce rate double, and, uh, and, and no one's doing anything about it. We are. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely correct, spot on with your analysis. Um, Eric and I co-founded an organization called Marriage Generation, which basically says, no offense, your generation dropped the ball on connecting children to mom and dad to the importance of marriage. And so we have uh, marriagegeneration.org that um, is now a new initiative. Um, it's, it's not even evangelically oriented necessarily. It's, it's simply built upon the idea that we need to reframe the conversation um, of talking about um, how disastrous divorce, cohabitation, out of wedlock, uh, childbearing has been in our nation, and I, you know, that takes courage to do those types of things. And I'm, I'm not trying to say individuals like Eric and I are are the great moral exemplars of the nation, but we've become somewhat um, known for being um, uh, defenders of natural marriage, and uh, it's not it's not a, a fun position to subject yourself to. To have tried to. Have you tried to go after the major institutions and say, why aren't you doing something about this? I mean, having a website is nice, mm -hmm. but what, if we could move the Southern Baptists to actually do something, yeah. or the Catholic Church to actually take a stand against no fault divorce, I mean, that would be something significant. That's what I'm trying to do with the organization I'm with, is called Marriage Day, that's what we yeah. try to do. Yeah. But we, I, I don't confess any great success here. Yeah. Are you trying? Uh, to, to penetrate institutions, I, I, I would say, I mean, to come clean, I don't, I don't know if we have successfully penetrated any particular institutions um, other than. We just started. We just started. Yeah, I mean, we started last week. Yeah, I know. I mean, getting quoted in the New York Times constitutes getting into an institution and communicating something of, of public import. Then, yeah, but uh, you're exactly right. We we have not got to the SBC or the Roman Catholic Church saying, hey folks, let's back up the train. Yeah, I, 
I think your point's exact is very well taken, and that we do need to do some very practical things um, on, on a legal level and and on in other cultural spheres related to this. If you haven't read Jonathan Last's book, What to Expect When No One's Expecting, can I just say that you you need to because um, he lays out what's the name of the book? What to expect when no one is expecting, and it just came out a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is it? What is it about? It is about demography. Uh, in America, specifically fertility rates, and um, last, it takes uh, a very esoteric subject and just paints a picture that's ex compelling and fun to read. You'll find yourself bugging your spouse every paragraph with some really cool quip that he points out. Um, uh, Three percent of the world's population lives in a in a nation that has an above replacement rate fertility rate. Three percent. No industrialized country on earth is replacing their population. Um, we are on the path to extinction, all of us. Um, and it's because we've created a culture that does not understand marriage and family, it does not understand why we get married and why we have kids. Um, it uh, last says that um, people used to put kids at the center of their lives and they don't anymore, and the reason is because they put themselves there. Yeah. It's postman. It's exactly that. We are the center of our own lives. We have no broader moral perspective that says, I exist for reasons outside of myself. And um, so no-fault divorce is part of that, but it's not the only part. Um, last is there are a thousand things, big and small, that have led us to this culture that doesn't understand marriage and family. And so um, we need more than just our organization or yours. We've got to be influencing this um, in a thousand different ways to try to renew a culture of marriage and family. Just commenting, if you, if you, we have Jonathan Last speaking at FRC this Wednesday, lunchtime event. Yeah, I, I, on a personal note, since we are, we are doing, uh, we're into the narrative and stuff like that, it, I, I was in high school in the 80s and, and late 80s and early 90s, and I, I was the only one amongst my friend group of at least 10 guys, I was the only one whose parents were still together, okay? And that was the late 80s and early 90s. So to, to say then that, that, uh, you know, we're going to recapture, or we're going to capture traditional marriage it, to to a general. I'm 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 pushing forty. No one under forty is going. What What are you talking about? What 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 marriage? What What are you calling us back to? I I I, I have no experience there. So we really are building a foundation of truth of what real marriage is and things like that. It's it's uh, the. You know the fact that we're not into institutions yet. I, it's. Uh, I mean, gosh, you're right. But we got to start somewhere. We're yeah, we're building an institution. Um, you mentioned that a way we can solve this cultural war is to practice telling more beautiful stories. Can you give me examples of people who you think are doing that? I was going to mention marriagegeneration.org. I think it's the beginning of something there. Um, I've also appreciated some of the narrative aspects of what Heritage is doing with the Seek Social Justice curricula and trying to explain and fill out the meaning, meaning of true justice. Didn't hear the, question ah, the question is basically how do we tell beautiful stories? Um, what, what kind of stories? Mm -hmm. um, so I think Heritage Foundation is doing, has done some good work there with Seek Social Justice. I, I appreciate what uh, Acton Institute has been doing with Poverty Cure. Um, and then in, in the pamphlets, the booklets that I'm editing, um, 40 years after Roe v. Wade, we specifically chose six women, very intentionally, to tell their stories um, and their involvement, both in the movement, but then much more broadly, just their stories of interaction and their own children and decisions related to um, abortion and Roe v. Wade. So, you know, difficult, not always beautiful stories, but trying to put those two next to each other. Can I just real quick say, um, I love that, and we have absolutely have to be doing that. We have to kind of condescend to the level of people who are willing to just tell stories and not try to do data. Um, but we also should tell ugly stories, I think. I think we need to shine a light in dark places in some instances. Um, the fact that the modern American um, understanding of gay marriage is Cam and his partner from Modern Family is just so 
um, upsetting to me because they're literally the least likely couple in American demographics. Gay men are the least likely to express a desire to get married. They're the least likely to express a desire to have children, to adopt children. They're the least likely to be, I mean, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. But that's what everyone thinks of. That's, that's why they're winning this debate, because who doesn't want to give equal rights to Cam? Uh, he's so funny, right? Um, the reality is, if you look in um, um, uh, Regnaris's work, <clears throat> there's pain here. There's brokenness. It's not pretty what you see in these areas where um, same-sex relationships, especially among women, which occur in, in um, predominantly African-American urban communities, there's so much brokenness. And if, if we would do what No Child, um, what's Waiting for Superman did for school choice related to family, I think we would really gain some ground because there's a, there are some ugly stories there that might wake some people up. Yeah, I, I see it in your eye. You don't even have to raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, Speak yeah. Up. Where there's an effort to not break down into peer groups over much. Um, so I'm blessed to spend time, in, I'm not married right now, I am blessed to spend time with families and, and see good behavior modeled well. Um, and so I think church communities that foster that are willing to mix things up and, and have the good hard teaching but there are no, no known examples where that is being flaunted or denied within people who have chosen to commit themselves publicly to that church. Um, yeah, I think that Jessica touched on a good point there. Um, I think that where that happens, where that cultivation happens, really is in, um, well, I mean, <clears throat> there are, you know, unlimited numbers of factors which that shape how we see things and how we make our decisions but a lot of it is the relationships that we're in and who um, people that we view as influential influential in our lives um, and so I think that um, that the age segregation um, is a real problem uh, within the church um, and it happens especially a lot within a city like in within cities like DC and New York where um, churches are all young people um, and so if you're there's if you can't see the example of people that you admire and respect um, further along in life um, and see the decisions that they made to get there see the mistakes that they made and um, how they would have done things differently when you don't have that um, it's difficult to um, see how what you believe can actually translate into how you live your life um, when everyone else around you is also not living according to um, what they you know, say they believe. So um, I think calling the older generation to be mentors, to be to disciple uh, younger uh, believers is really, really important. Um, and to not be afraid to speak um, the truth. Um, also, among our peers, to not be afraid to say, you know, if something is is wrong, in love to say that that is not a right way to live, um, and to not forsake um, fellowship together and studying the Bible and praying together is um, is really critical in um, how we shape how we actually live our lives. So. Um, just two thoughts. Uh, first, real quick, um, I would say uh, tell them to get married. Um, really, I mean, uh, it's natural for people our age to want to have sex. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So um, just tell them to get married and they can have as much as they want. Right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the second thing I would say is in, in college student affairs, um, we deal a lot with, with student um, alcohol use. That's a major issue. And there's some research that's been done on the difference between students' actual use of alcohol and their perception of the uses of alcohol on campus. And what you find is that when students self-report about their use of alcohol, the rates are pretty low. But when you ask them to report their perceptions of their peers' use of alcohol, they all believe all of their friends are drinking a lot more than they actually are. Um, the Washington Post yesterday had a story about sex on campus and how unfulfilling and boring it's become in this hookup culture. And one of the pieces of that story was this idea that they feel like it's kind of what everyone is doing. You know? We've heard this for forever, right? If you feel like your friends are doing something, it's peer pressure, it's pretty basic. So I think maybe just an, an information campaign 
where we, we go out and we say in some quippy way, it's storytelling, like, you're not alone. Like, here's, here's what you may think is the norm. Here's the actual norm. It turns out nobody wants to be doing this. Nobody's happy doing this. If we would all just kind of like take off our hoods and look around and go, oh, we're, we're actually all on the, on the same page um, and we all think we're not, um, that we might, we might gain some, some ground there. Um, and that can look like in, in an age of social media, you know, infographics and, and pictures that you can share and um, uh, traditional advertising in, in, in magazines and that kind of thing. I think a whole campaign could be done just on, on that one issue. It turns out that um, people actually deep down in, inside do have a sense of the significance of sexuality. They just feel like no one else does. So we should remind everyone that we all do. Right. Now, now can I? Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to our panel. Mm -hmm. Give them a hand. All on Twitter and uh, so, like that. Cool. so you know, and uh, I think we were live tweeting this or something for sure. Okay, yeah, okay, and uh, yeah, as you can see, that it's the uh, the challenges are before us, but there's hope because there are four people who should give you a lot of hope right now. Okay, and uh, they're looking, of course, to the one who gives the most hope, that is Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, so thank you all very much for coming, and uh, have a great day. <clears throat>